Dr. John Lau. Is there uh, any way? Hi, everybody. Uh, I am John Lau. And uh, uh, is there a way of darkening anything? So you there is. Great. Oh, this darkens it too? No, he's. Oh, he's dark. Good. All right. I'll see how I can do with this. The clicker, I usually just stay in next to the machine in my classes. Uh, a couple of preliminaries uh, is that uh, uh, how many students do I have? Uh, I know Janet's here. What other students? Uh, she has a sign in sheet. Uh, so, Elise, yes. And so, make sure you sign in. Could you raise your hand, Janet? Yeah, so it's over there. Make sure you sign in. I did. Uh, I don't know if it was uh, unfair of me, but uh, for the other um, presentations, I uh, encouraged my students to come to the last two very good presentations by giving five points extra credit towards their participation grade. Uh, I gave a thousand points if they come to mind. <laughs> 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 I, I don't know. Apparently, they didn't take me seriously. Though, so, uh, but or they first well, or they've heard my lectures enough, right? <laughs> they know when to stay away. So, uh, okay, so Pokagnik Potawatomic, uh, that's in our language, the Pokagnik Potawatomi Indian people. And so I'll get started. And uh, so I uh, essentially wanted to talk very briefly about uh, just that there's a lot of Native peoples, Indigenous peoples of uh, what we now call Ohio. Now, in the uh, Western Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, you know, we got thrown out of Eden. Well, here, we were living in Eden. You know, so we were, uh, one of the epicenters of uh, native population was here in Ohio River Valley. Uh, wonderful uh, resources, temperate climate, great place to live. Uh, so life was good, uh, and so uh, these are some of the historic tribes. Uh, it gets uh, sort of confusing about uh, because you know we know that there's stories that this is I got this off of some uh, uh, of OHS Ohio History Connections uh, website I think, and actually we know too that uh, prior to contact it appears that the Cherokee may have come through here. Choctaw, the Lakota, the Dakota, lots of other people. Uh, this was a place of uh, migration as well as a place of uh, residency. And so all of these peoples uh, have connections to uh, perhaps the ancestors of uh, uh, the built these uh, mounds here. So, uh, who are the Potawatomi? Me and 4,999 other people are in my band. Uh, we uh, uh, are from Southwest Michigan in Northwest Indiana. We uh, congregated along the rivers in that area. And uh, uh, you know, rivers were sources of, they were resources for food, but also for travel, of course. And we traveled a lot. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, origins, uh, we have lots lots of origin stories and that's one of the themes of this talk today is origin stories. We have at least four that I've grown up with. Uh, one is that uh, we uh, were lowered through a hole in the sky. Uh, my grandmother told me that story. It took me to the place on the St. Joseph River near Mishawaka, Indiana where that happened. That is a very holy place. Another story that that event occurred, but it was at the mouth of the Grand River as it empties into Lake Michigan. Uh, that's a good that's a good explanation too. We had stories that wherever we came from, we migrated ultimately from the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. Uh, so we were actually Eastern Seaboard folks before we came here. And there's also uh, sort of the explanation that uh, some people. Uh, subscribe to that uh, we came across the Bering Strait by a boat or canoes or by a foot or whatever. Would have preferred uh, sleds. 
Um, but however, however we came. And then there's, of course, the book of Genesis, right? Gives uh, an origin story that's very important to a lot of our people, too. We have a tradition in my community, like many Native communities, that we don't tell other people that their stories are wrong. So we have a lot of stories. Those stories feed us, they nurture us, and they uh, uh, keep us uh, alive. And so we share those stories with each other. And so, um, I wanted to talk about the connections to the, uh, the mounds themselves. And I know that's one of the outreach aspects of the Newark Earthwork Center is uh, bringing indigenous peoples back to the mounds or to the mounds, uh, however you want to describe that, uh, uh, because that's important, right? We're the descendants of the mound builders, and we're the first peoples. And I specifically remember, I was growing up, uh, Uncle Frank was uh, a, the spiritual leader of my community when I was growing up. And uh, so, uh, a very uh, wise man, a very spiritual person, um, very informative, always willing to give, always willing to share, always willing to teach. And he talked about um, the sweat lodge and uh, the longhouse and the connections. Uh, we have a fire inside the longhouse and inside the uh, fire the sweat lodge and there's four circles. And so he explained what those four circles represent. And they represent, they celebrate our connections um, that uh, we have to the uh, to these months, to these uh, earthworks. And uh, so we, there's a process for doing that. We apologize whenever we disturb Mother Earth and don't whiskey on. Uh, we lay tobacco down because it's one of our sacred medicines. And then he said that uh, the first uh, is in honor of the mammoth people, what uh, sometimes get called the Paleo Indians, right? Uh, the second is to honor the Adena people. And the third is to honor the Hopo people. And the last ring is to honor us, contemporary Indian peoples. And so here's a person speaking in 1993, uh, told me this was a common story that he would tell people, share in the community. But it was um, also recorded uh, that you know <coughs> we're connected. Uh, we're the descendants of uh, these peoples, and we honor these people. So um, we have mounds also of where I'm from in Michigan, and uh, as probably many of you know, uh, and as uh, uh, the previous two speakers were talking about, mounds go all over, uh, particularly with the eastern half of the United States, but also you know, west of the Mississippi too, down into uh, Mexico, uh, up into Canada. Uh, the uh, mounds here, fortunately, were saved by uh, landowners, uh, which is a nice story, right? Usually we hear the stories about them being plowed over, right? Dug up, plowed over, corn planted or whatever. Uh, the people in Somerville took it upon themselves to preserve these mounds. And as would so happen, now it's a mile south of the headquarters for the uh, Pokemon Padawami tribal nation. So uh, this is our territory uh, at its peak. Uh, went from Port County up in Wisconsin down to almost St. Louis through Illinois around the southern end of Lake Michigan up to Grand Rapids over to Detroit and Ann Arbor, and down to the Maumee River Valley of Ohio. So uh, we were uh, very proud to, uh, to you know, we, we didn't have fences around this. We shared this land with other indigenous peoples, right? Miami, Shawnee, uh, other people, so we jumped the Menominee. Uh, and, but this was our space, too. So, the emergence of Pokagon's band, right? because we're Potawatomi. Potawatomi, essentially, the Potawatomi means human being. Right? I'm a human being. Anishinaabe, I'm a human being. I'm a two-legged in the great realm of things. Uh, Potawatomi 
also represents that I'm a keeper of the fire, right? Uh, so, what does this idea of Pokagon Spain, Padawami, come from? Well, it essentially comes from that guy, which, um, to my great uh, inflated ego, uh, my one of my professors at University of Chicago said that she thought I looked a lot like him. <laughs> <laughs> Never recovered from that. Right? <laughs> so, uh, except that he has gray white hair. Of course, I have very dark brown hair. <laughs> uh, as an aside, I was at the uh, driver's license bureau a couple of months ago getting a driver's license. And when the uh, lady said, uh, going through my vitals, and said hair color, you know, eye color blue, uh, hair color brown, and she looked at me, raised her hat, <laughs> said, really? <laughs> Brown. <laughs> uh, great. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Wait. 180. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so Leopold uh was uh, took over from uh, chiefs that uh, each village uh, in that area had chiefs that uh, sort of by consensus were um, helped uh, facilitate decision making. Uh, we were egalitarian, democratic, uh, clan mothers, uh, the women, and men participated in decision making equally. Nothing got accomplished without the agreement of all. We did have enough space that if you had an argument, one of the uh, recourses that you had, if you had enough people that agreed with you, go over the hill and create your own village, right? That was one way. We didn't have to vote people in and vote people out. Uh, we just uh, created more villages. So, Pretty good system, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but uh, in the 1820s, uh, Leopold took over for his father in law, smart guy, married uh, the chief's daughter, and uh, Tatnaby. And so he, uh, this is not a hereditary uh, position uh, or by marriage or whatever, but he was, a, he was a great leader. And you could see the writing on the wall was that it was going to become important to uh, strategically accommodate. One of the ways that he did that was by uh, convincing his village to Catholicize. There was a memory uh, passed on of Jesuit priests 100 years earlier, uh, uh, working with our, with our peoples. Other Jesuits, it seemed to be pretty cool, particularly compared to the Baptists that were there now, and were pushing for removal. Um, so, uh, and the Catholics wanted us to stay, and so we liked that, and so we Catholicized. And so that was his village. And then as negotiations started about after 1830 with the Indian Removal Act, the ethnic cleansing that was intended for Indians east of the Mississippi to get forcefully um, or coercively moved west of the Mississippi, uh, he was uh, trying to play a drink card, right? So many of the other villages started to combine into, um, you know, they would say, well, you're going to have to move unless you're with Pokagon Village. Mm, you know what? I'm with Pokagon Village. Um, and so, incredibly, the size of his uh, political leadership and the size of our villages grew to about 12 different villages that were all becoming Pokagon Villages. Catholic villages. And so, um, in the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, the last Great Land Session Treaty, east of the Mississippi, as they call it, uh, the um, last land was, was ceded. Uh, Leopold Pokagon kept his negotiators away from all the other Potawatomi and the Indian agents and the traders and the liquor sellers. He uh, professed, you know, he announced uh, an edict of uh, abstention from alcohol and uh, that we weren't going to give up the land. Uh, that, uh, ho however, we needed to strategically accommodate that uh, we weren't going to give up the land. The land was the most important thing to us. Other Potawatomi groups felt differently, you know, that they were more connected perhaps to the ceremonies and the traditions than to the land. 
we made a choice to be the state on the land. We walk, we have a saying back home, that we walk on the bones of our ancestors. And that's a, a matter of pride, right, that we do that, and uh, of reverence. And so he negotiated an exception. Of all the Indians that got moved out in this last treaty, there was an addendum that Pokagans tried because they were good Indians, we could stay. So we were the good Indians. So, um, so we uh, we continued on. Then, and what's, what nurtures, what feeds us? Of course, food, water, air, uh, beliefs, values, stories, too, right? We need to pass on from one generation to the next stories. Stories that keep us distinct as a people. The people, the, the glue, stories are the glue that holds the community together. So, who tells our stories? Uh, who tells our stories to the general public? These folks have, right? Uh, and that's all fine. In fact, many of our stories would have been lost had they not been uh, collected by folks like this. Because we had a lot of death and disease, or disease and death, uh, a lot of elders that uh, were not able to pass their stories along. And so we would have lost them. So kudos to these folks. But we were never silent. We never quit telling our own stories, too. Right? So we have the oral tradition. And so we have uh, creation stories. We have songs. We have stories about tricksters and cultural heroes. We have life lessons. We have stories that explain all sorts of things. This is a great painting I love. This is about the creation of the world uh, and the story of the great flood how it cleansed the earth, that the Wayne of Bujou is represented by a birch tree. The birch is very important sacred material to us. Uh, he's a shapeshifter, so he can take any form that he wants to. He took the form of that, the anchor, onto the back of the turtle. The turtle floated around. And to make the story short, because I can tell this story, you know, four to six hours. Uh, but I think that's the audience. Um, is that essentially muskrat saves the day, the weakest animal saves the day by diving to the bottom of the ocean, getting up a little bit of soil and putting it on top of the turtle's back. Then the creator takes pity on us and expands turtle to, depending on how you tell the story, either Michigan or North America or the Western Hemisphere or the world for the universe, right? So, uh, lots of rooms for lots of story. So, uh, thank goodness for Muscovy. Uh, so, other ways the story's been told, pictographs, of course, this is in Wisconsin. Uh, ancestors of the Ho-Chunk uh, uh, may, uh, may have created this uh, storytelling artwork. Uh, petroglyphs, uh, this is, uh, probably Midday Teachings in Petersboro, in Ontario province. Uh, Midday Teachings in the Ojibwe, possibly Potawatomi too. And, uh, so we had other forms of storytelling uh, besides the written word on books. We never quit telling our stories. We never kept, we never quit passing them on. We would do them orally. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is that we also conveyed them in other ways, too, three-dimensional ways. Three-dimensional ways. Well, three-dimensional ways leads into talking about the mountains, right, and the earthworks. This is Norton Mountains of their Grand Rapids. Um, it's uh, an important uh, area. We have uh, essentially how we, we talk about uh, mountains is that they are stories, that they are texts, that they at the very least, for instance, Norton Mounds, which is, represents the fertility of, I don't know, excuse me, of course there are other mounds that were burial mounds, right? And uh, their stories may be uh, better left uh, undisturbed uh, with, with those people that are there, but they were stories too. 
uh, there. And then there's the story of the earthworks and the Great Circle and Circle Mount and those types of places. So, how we reconcile, because I've heard this sometimes, that people say, well, if some of your people believe that you migrated from the mouth of the St. Lawrence River 500 or 1,000 years ago, and a lot of the archaeologists say that he came from the Cree up in Canada and migrated down 500 to 1,000 years ago. Uh, how do you claim a connection to the builders of uh, these mounds? And uh, one of my elders, I thought, uh, answered it pretty succinctly, is that, well, there had to be somebody here when we got here, if we did migrate here. And knowing the Potawatomi, we intermarried with them. <laughs> so, you know, good looking Potawatomi men and women, so uh, <laughs> and we would have been quite the catch. And uh, so, we're still the descendants of the, uh, because we, whether we've been here, since the beginning, or whether we came here, we've still uh, become embedded like months are in the landscape. So uh, this was uh, interesting work that uh, uh, archaeologists by the name of John O'Shea did um, a couple of years ago. And uh, John, and John O'Shea and I have had a sort of rocky relationship. Um, I was a grad student at Michigan. He was in charge of the ancestral remains there, and until the president removed him from that position, he was basically of the opinion that ancestors never get repatriated. They, we need them, right? Um, that's not what the federal law says. And uh, so, uh, thankfully, the university president took, uh, uh, took our uh, position to heart and so but he, he did good work uh, on this uh, Misaki earthworks I think uh, article that he published that talks about how the earthworks essentially uh, compared them to drawings collected by Ruth Landis an earlier anthropologist uh, uh, working among the Ojibwe and Midday people uh, in the uh, Great Lakes region and essentially shows in an article that uh, it's the earthworks represent on the earth a recreation of the story of Bears Crossing, which is a very important story to my day. So, the story is written on the landscape. Earthworks is text. So, we've continued, and one of the things that uh, I've thought about is that uh, what do we do when we're not able to get to those earthworks and those mounds anymore? What do we do when we can't take our children there anymore and explain to them the stories, right? Uh, and that happened after uh, uh, the uh, settler colonists came here, is that our movement was greatly restricted. We could not just go when we wanted to, uh, where we wanted to, and so it was very, um, very difficult. So we had to imagine different ways of telling those stories. And as I previously mentioned in the earlier slide, we continue to tell those stories through songs, through birch bark scrolls, and other means. But what I find fascinating is that in 1893, Simon Pokagan, the son of Leopold Pokagan, the patriarch of our tribe, issued a birch bark booklet the Red Man's Greeting, that he sold at the World's Columbian Exposition. And birch bark, well, why not birch bark? One is iconic, right? Or you think birch bark, you think it means maybe back in 1893, what he did. But it also is sacred material. It represents the sacredness of what he's doing. And the fact that he's continuing on in this tradition of telling stories through traditional means with an adaptation. Right. So he tells this story, and in it, um, he essentially, I won't read the whole slide to you. I generally find that people hate it when I read slides, you know. but um, I'll read the end of it. He says, and while your hearts, this is again the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, uh, just a year off from the, uh, uh, you know, the, what 
was in the gorgeous centennial or something uh, um, of uh, Columbus's discovery of the new world. Um, it says, and while your hearts in admiration rejoice over the beauty and grandeur of this young republic, and you say, behold the wonders wrought by our children in this foreign land, do not forget that this success has been at the sacrifice of our homes and our and a once happy race. So, and he's, there's resistance um, there, right? He's uh, 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 remonstrating, he's rebuking, he's sort of chastising people for, don't forget to um, include Indians in the sacrifices that we've made when you celebrate all that you've accomplished. So, he also wrote a book on the first early uh, novels, uh, Okamakwe Mirigwaki, Queen of the Woods. I got published in 1999. That's the frontispiece, that's Simon. And uh, a good book. It's been republished with essays by University of Michigan Press, and I have to say that book. You can get it for $1.99 on eBay. Um, and I'm still waiting for my royalty check. Uh, it's, uh, I never got it. Uh, so, uh, nationhood and tribal citizenship. We became a nation, right? The Pokagon Potawatomi, uh, in response to uh, the uh, political realities uh, in the early 1800s, right? And so we negotiated with the federal government on a government-to-government -government relationship. We were signatories to the Treaty of Greenville in Ohio. We were uh, signatories to over 100 treaties um, uh, during the time. So we had a lot of land and it got piecemeal dumped. And so that, that treaty uh, uh, making is a confirmation of our nationhood and a confirmation of our sovereignty as a people who have a right to determine their own affairs, right? The right to self-determination. So, nationhood and tribal citizenship. So we continued as a nation. We in fact sued the city of Chicago in 19, uh, well, it went up to the United States Supreme Court in 1913. We sued the city of Chicago for the Chicago Lakefront. So we were still acknowledged as a nation at that point in 1913. We did lose the suit. Uh, we were hoping for all the land east of Michigan Avenue, which would have included the uh, Silver Field, Drake Hotel, Illinois Central Railroad, uh, Art Institute. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, it was a bold claim. And we didn't win. Uh, we were arguing that the treaties used the lake as the boundary line. And as the Chicagoans filled in the lake, they didn't ask our permission to do that. And as a result, whatever they built upon it was on unceded territory. And the federal law says that you have to go through a process to take land from Indians. There's supposed to be some sense of due process, some sense of uh, land session through treaty making, and they never did that. Uh, I think by 1913, uh, 1917, that Europe, uh, the court was not going to uh, give all of that to us. But uh, had they, you know, I'd be living at the top of Trump, you know, kind of knows, you know I wouldn't be here. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, but it still shows a matter, we weren't uh, hiding, we weren't just hiding in plain sight, uh, we were actively resisting and actively asserting our rights. Uh, so, uh, that's Rush Lake Mission uh, in 1906. And uh, Rush Lake was up by Hartford, Michigan, where Simon Pokagan lived. Uh, we had some problems within the community, and there was a split in the 1870s. Essentially, a, a third of the group moved to South Bend, Indiana. A third of the group stayed in the Dowagic, Michigan area. And a third of the group stayed up in Hartford at the Rush Lake Mission. Uh, wherever they could find a Catholic church, they sort of congregate, right? And 
uh, so uh, the good news is that we're all back together as one family family, sort of, right? And uh, so, uh, in the 1930s, we tried to organize, reorganize under the Indian Reorganization Act, an act which was going to allow tribes to become democratically constituted governments. And our tribal council petitioned the Bureau of Indian Affairs for the right to do this. Some bureaucrat at the Bureau of Indian Affairs wrote back and said, well, you know, it's a depression. We don't have any money for anything. And uh, we're not going to pay any attention to any Indians in Michigan that live south of about 100 miles north of Lansing. So you're on your own. Don't write again. We won't write back. So we had no services. Uh, we were essentially uh, terminated, uh, unilaterally terminated, before there was even a termination policy of the federal government. We were terminated. Well, we fought that for 60 years. And finally, in 1994, uh, we uh, got Congress to pass a bill that restored our sovereignty, restored our nationhood, and there's a good-looking Bill Clinton uh, signing our bill. Um, and uh, so uh, I was, I had, a, I had, a, had to be in court that day, so I could not be there in Washington, D.C., so I missed out on all the press release after about uh, 25 years of work, because that's how that goes. Uh, so, anyway, so it, we then began the process of rebuilding the nation, right? But we've always told the stories. We never forgot the stories. Uh, whether it was back then, they were telling the stories. Uh, we continued to tell stories. My grandmother told me stories. My uncles told me stories. The elders would tell stories. Uh, we would get together. The Catholic Church, I think, was uh, sort of a genius. I don't know if it was conscious, but Leopold Pokagon, when he signed up for us to be Catholics, of course, as many of you know, in the 1800s, 1830s, wasn't particularly popular to be Catholic, right? There was a Catholic hysteria going on, right? They were lynching Catholics. Uh, why would he choose the Catholics besides this sort of story of, well, we remember the Jesuits? I think the other reason, perhaps, intentional or unintentional genius, was that uh, we became doubly insulated. We became known not only as the Potawatomi Indians, but those damn Catholic Potawatomi Indians, right? And so nobody else had, we had a double lining around us. We were Catholic, and we were Potawatomi, and people left us alone, right? They didn't try to uh, 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 break us. They didn't try to remove us. We did get embedded in the economy there. There were a lot of small factories. We became wage laborers. Uh, we were the first migrant workers up there along the uh, eastern uh, shore of Lake Michigan in the Fruit Belt. We became the first migrant workers. Uh, we worked at Notre Dame, which was established as a place to train Potawatomi men to become priests and Potawatomi women at St. Mary's to become nuns. We became the service people at Notre Dame. So we became embedded in the economy. And so uh, it was, uh, uh, and we didn't cause a lot of trouble. You know, we, we fit in. So um, this is our service area now, as the President Clinton. We don't have a reservation, but this is our main population, 10 counties. Six counties in Indiana, four counties in Michigan, and we're the closest federally recognized tribe. This is really sort of shocking and sad. We're the closest federally recognized tribe to Newark, my community. And we're what, 350 miles away. Wow. So um, how many reservations are there in Pennsylvania? None. How many reservations in West Virginia? None. How many reservations in Kentucky? None. How many reservations in Ohio? None. How many reservations in Illinois? None. How many reservations in Indiana? None. But we're the only federally recognized tribe in Indiana. So there was a huge clearing out, but we were able to figure out a way to stay. 
So, tribal services more than casinos. I will mention though that we didn't. We we have three casinos now. Four wins casinos. One, two, and three. Uh, we're hoping to build a fourth in South Bend, and it's been a great uh, cash flow into the community. A uh, lot less reliance on the federal government, which always has and always will want to get out of the Indian business anyway, right? Uh, and so uh, we participate in Indian gaming. Uh, there was, uh, you know, the irony was that there were six river boats between Gary and Michigan City, uh, the Harrods, Trump, Blue Chip, Hollywood, and some others. But because we wanted to build a casino like 30 miles to the east, there were great protests about how we were going to destroy the very fabric of American society. Right? And so we uh, spent six years tied up in courts before we could get the casino opened. Finally we got it opened and lo and behold, the day we opened, uh, we created 2,500 jobs. We're the second largest employer in Bering County, next to Whirlpool. We're the largest employer in Cass County. Uh, these are not minimum wage, entry level jobs at McDonald's. These are jobs that pay a living wage, $25,000 to $30,000 a year entry level. They employ tribal members and a lot of non-tribal members, right? And so a lot of people have seen the benefits. We also pay percentages of our revenue to the state of Michigan and to local municipalities. And I also got a report, oh, it was on the paper, the sun and sheet. Um, and uh, our chair reported our finances. Uh, besides the jobs we created, besides the monies that we paid to the state according and to the local municipalities, uh, based upon our contract to do so, our agreement, we've contributed in the last three years $167 million to the local community. $167 million. This is a community that was a rust belt. I don't know if it's uh, analogous, but where I come from reminds me of Newark. Essentially, mostly closed factories, mostly dead downtowns, you know, people um, uh, that used to have a good, uh, you know, I mean, it was the American dream. Uh, blue collar workers could uh, have a send their kids to college, they have a cottage or a boat, an RV, uh, and now they're finding their grandkids have to start working at Renaissance or in uh, McDonald's for minimum wage with no upward mobility, right? That's how it is at home anyway. I don't know if that's the same here. But imagine if you had an entity here that was pumping in $167 million, $88 million in the last year, $88 million in the local uh, economy. It's pretty staggering, right? So. How are the uh, profits from the casino share with the people, mostly it's reinvested. Uh, we had to finance the casinos, and so we paid almost all of them off uh, faster than uh, was required because we didn't want to pay interest. Uh, and you know they're very expensive buildings to create. And then we have essentially an obligation to provide for the next seven generations. So we do a lot of saving of money. And then we have. Uh, college scholarships, we have uh, institutions like Indian Health, uh, we have the Woodward Health Services that we provide, elder housing, and uh, ultimately we get uh, also a small monthly check, right? That, uh, Everyone in the tribe gets a small monthly check? Yes. Mm -hmm. But is it all the same amount? No, uh, the elders get $500 more. So I was very happy when I turned 55. <laughs> it, it doubled my per cap. That's what it's called, the per cap. It doubled my per cap. So, you know, I'm living in Texas City now. You know, I almost pay my heating bill with that. Um, 
know, so it's, uh, um, but it's, we've also, um, you know, that's not the, um, I mean, we come from a, where we come from is we have had role models that have been working all their lives. My, grand, my mother worked, my grandmother worked, my great-grandmother worked. You know, we, that's the value system, is that people work. Uh, they don't expect handouts, uh, and they don't want handouts. What they want is basic services provided. What they want are, a, uh, if they get sick, that they're going to have health care. If they get old, that they're going to have some kind of assistant living. Uh, that their children can have head start. Uh, that's the, the, for the kids that they go to college, so they can have a college scholarship. That's the sorts of things that really get us stoked. Um, you know, and frankly, contributing to the, to the economy, because we've had good relations uh, with the neighboring uh, community. Uh, it's not been a hotbed of difficult tensions you know, for the last 100 years. We were always engaged in the community. Um, sometimes we were seen as sort of quaint. Sometimes we were seen as sort of tourist attractions. But we dealt with it, you know. And it's, uh, we never, we don't have like in some, uh, some reservation communities where, you know, if you go off the reservation, you take your life in your hands. You know, uh, you stand a good chance of getting killed. Um, you know, you, um, I mean, there's no way to, uh, the, this is, I did not grow up on Pine Ridge, you know, in uh, South Dakota. I did not grow up in the poorest, you know, uh, reservation, you know, fourth world type living conditions, you know. Um, my mother was a legal secretary and my dad was a lawyer, so, you know, pretty much a yuppie. So, uh, um, so, and I've got five college degrees. <laughs> to that scholarship. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, as my grandmother would have said, anyone that spent as much time as I did in college cannot be very smart. Uh, and, uh, and she's in fact true. Uh, but uh, that's another story. Um, the uh, uh, other little stories uh, that uh, mentioned, for instance, uh, little things that my uh, sort of worldview, I remember in third grade, my grandmother who helped raise me a lot because my mother was working. Uh, came home from third grade, and so, you know, we say Buju to say hello in Potawatomi language. And our third grade teacher had read some book somewhere, right? And she said, oh, you know, they, they took that from the French bonjour, right? So I was all excited to tell grandma that the French taught us how to say hello, <laughs> you know? So grandma was, you know, she had the papers, 1960s, right? You know, she's cooking something. Her big spice was paprika, so she probably had something with paprika on it. There's no flavor, right? You know, but that's, you know, that's the zesty part of the cooking. And uh, so she was making that, and she laughed and laughed, and I told her. And she said, well, I think we knew how to say hello before the French got here. <laughs> Why don't you tell your teacher that we taught the French how to say hello. <laughs> I also was reminded, I uh, tell my students, you know, I noticed that, uh, um, you know, so the mouth can only make so many sounds, you know, right? And so in the news, what is it? In Iraq, there's the uh, Mosul, uh, it's a city that's being fought over right now by ISIS and the Iraqi army and the Kurds, Mosul, right? Okay, Mosul. Well, in Germany, where does the best white wine come from? The Mosul River Valley, you know? So I don't think the Iraqis taught the Germans, you know, how to pronounce Mosul. You know, it's just, you know, sometimes words are going to have a similarity. And so celebrate the diversity. So more than casinos, because that's definitely what uh, our charged our tribal council has always been. So we've got an administration center need a capital building if you're going to be a nation, right? So, pretty nice looking. We're very proud of it anyway. It sure beats the one-room schoolhouse that when I was working with the tribe for that 30 years, 25 years, you know, we used to have a one-room schoolhouse. We did not own the parking lot. The farmer let us park on the parking lot gratis. And we had to take a collection every day we met to pay for the heating bill. Right? That's how we started out with. Now we got that. 
that's our community center for elders, right? We're pretty proud of that. Uh, that's a pretty nice place for them to be able to go. Uh, we have a powwow dance area. I remember putting up the powwow dance area that Arbor every year and taking it down every year because it was the county park. It's nice to have a solid place. We have a gathering of tribes that comes there. Um, we have Head Start program, right? And we have both native and non-native kids come to our Head Start program because it's one of the best in the area. And so what we are preserving, why are we doing all this, right? Is all of these things. These are the things that we're saving. And we're saving them through our stories. So in uh, October of last year, as some of you that were at uh, previous talks heard, uh, we had uh, Pokagon elders came uh, to visit the Newark Earthworks. Uh, they were very interested in uh, the opportunity to come down here, and it was great that, the, that Dick and Marty and others facilitated that. The Newark Earthworks Center uh, facilitated that. Uh, uh, it was a really wonderful opportunity. We had 18 elders on their little bus, you know, that they come down. Um, and so uh, they were very moved by it too. I don't think any of them had ever been here before. But it reminded me of the time when I first saw the earthworks, which was what, 2005? Was that the year? Uh, 2005, first time I saw the earthworks. And I'd been to um, Cahokia, I had been to Norton Mounds, I'd been to Angel Mounds. This is completely different. It was completely different. And walking into those spaces was um, profound for me. And I never forgot that. And so when the chap opened up here, I thought, well, oh, I'm going to apply to that one. Um, and uh, so I was fortunate enough, blessed, uh, to, uh, to get this job and to be able to live around here, right? And uh, to celebrate, uh, to participate in the celebrations that go on. I was honored to bring the elders down. I had several elders tell me specifically as they came into the ceremonial spaces that they were viscerally moved. They were physically touched, emotionally overwhelmed by that space. Now that's, uh, that's pretty, uh, pretty awesome stuff because uh, we aren't, you know, I'm educated, right? I'm also three quarters Irish. You know, and I was a lawyer and I'm a teacher, so I can blah, blah, blah all day, right? Most, most of my family in the tribe don't talk a lot, right? Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't waste words, as they would say. They don't waste words. So for them to say that, it was something very meaningful to them. And they want to come back, right? They want to keep coming back. And I'm hoping that we'll make sure that happens, right? And so, thought I would finish with this. <laughs> ah, Mount Builders Country Club, right? Uh, and, uh, so, uh, you know, and it is pretty odd. And maybe I'm, I don't know if I'm preaching to the church choir or not, but it's sort of odd that there's a private country club on land owned by you, right? It's under the management of the Ohio, Ohio History Society, or now the Ohio History Connections, but they don't own it. Who owns it? The taxpayers, the citizens of Ohio. Can you go on it? No, not unless you're a member. How can that happen? How can that happen? Well, you know, it's, some might use the word back home, they would probably say that's some kind of mismanagement went out there. Uh, whoever did that lease, you know, they sure will never do another lease like that, right? Well, of course they did another lease like that, right? So when does the lease end now? 2078. 2078. 2078, right? Is that good, good stewardship? Good management? Mm, I would argue perhaps not. I would argue Perhaps we should inquire deeper. But I'll put out the last thought that I wanted to conclude with is uh, because 
there's stories there. We may not be able to recapture all the stories from the past, or many of the stories from the past, but those are stories that are still valuable from the past. There are stories in the present that can, can be collected, right? Stories are based upon experiences. You can have golfing stories. I'm sure, I'm sure these guys have a lot of stories, right? You know, chipping off the uh, earthworks, yeah. putting on to the ceremonial uh, sacred green, right? I don't care about those stories, frankly, myself. Maybe that's uh, um, prejudice and inappropriate for me to say, but I'm sorry. I don't care about that. There's plenty of places you can go for golf course. Um, but if we have people here using this space as it was intended, or how we imagine it was intended, as a public space, as a space um, that we can come together, the new stories can be told, right? And so it's an opportunity. And I want to think about, well, how is that going to happen? Well, after 2076, or if, if there's an exit strategy, which was talked about last week, right? What if, uh, I mean, there's, what if the uh, Mount Builders Country Club finds another place to go to? Well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? What if they opened it up to, you know, the taxpayer citizens of this place? That would be good, too. But who's going to manage it? The Ohio History Connections? The people that signed the last two leases with the Mount Builders? Um, I might have another suggestion. How about if we collaborate and partner? How about a broader group of citizens from Ohio, groups like the Earthwork Center? And how about the descendants of some of the peoples that are connected to the Earthworks, the Native peoples? How about if we have a partnering of people so that the management in the future is for all of us, and so we can have all the stories told, both Native and non-Native, non -native, in a good way. That's my hope, that's my vision, and so I just want to put that on here. And that's it. So, this might be the first time that I've ever ended a lecture three minutes earlier, I <laughs> three minutes earlier. So,